Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session of PyCon 2017. Um, before we get started, I would like to encourage everyone with a device that is capable of making noise to please have a chat with it and ask it not to. Because when it does, everyone's going to stare at you and some people might be nasty to you on Twitter. With that said, um, I would like to introduce our next speaker. His name is Yuri Selivanov, and he will be talking about async and await and async IO. Please make him welcome. Hi, uh, I'm Yuri Selivanov. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, today we're going to talk about async await and async IO in Python 3.6 and beyond. Feel free to follow me on Twitter and email at why, why, at magic.io. So quickly about me. I'm core developer since 2013. Uh, worked on a number of peps, mostly about async and await. I maintain async IO, UV loop, and async PG. I work at Magic Stack. Uh, check out our website, magic.io. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with Python, uh, for Python, and sometimes to Python. It's pretty interesting. So let's talk about async await. And the first question is, why do we even have it? Because there are so many other ways how you can do concurrency. For instance, you can do threats, or you can code with callbacks and promises, or maybe you can do gevent, or use eventland, or stackless Python, or maybe you could just use generators with yield from syntax. And the answer is readability. It's unarguably better than callbacks or promises. I think anybody who tried to debug or refactor some JavaScript or old Python code with a lot of nested callbacks can attest to that. It's easier to reason about the async await code. You just see all those explicit points in your code when you can switch context for I.O. or for something else. And it actually promotes better patterns like message passing and not uh, having global shared data structures. Because no matter what you think about your ability to write multi-threading code, <laughs> you will inevitably end up having situation on the right side. Any other reasons? Well, efficiency. Since we have this little problem in Python called Gil, threads aren't always the answer. But even in the languages like C Sharp, where there is no Gil, we still have async await. Why? It's because threads are a system resource. You, you, you cannot have an infinite number of threads. So with async, you can, have, you can handle thousands or hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions of open, long-lasting connections on the server. Anyways, what is async await? Well, obviously, it's a syntax. We added them first in Python 3.5, and we added syntax to define coroutines or async functions, uh, syntax for asynchronous context managers, asynchronous iterators, and obviously, await expression. In 3.6, we took it even further. We now have asynchronous generators, asynchronous list comprehensions, and even asynchronous generator expressions. And I'd say that at this point, we have almost complete coverage of whatever you can do in Python uh, synchronous mode. You can do it in, with async await. Except one thing, this is yield from. Yield from for asynchronous generators. Uh, we might add syntax for yield from uh, in 3.7, uh, but this is not a top priority, I'll be honest with you. What else is async, is async await? It's a protocol. There is a common misconception that async await was created specifically for async IO or only async IO can use it. Uh, and this is not true. Internally, async await based on the iterator protocol. We have a bunch of magic methods like dunder await, which uh, allows you to make an object awaitable or used in an await expression. We have magic methods to define and create asynchronous iterators and asynchronous context managers. So it's pretty generic. Uh, you could totally write your own framework for async await, uh, but you probably shouldn't. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work, unless you want to experiment, of course. 
so if we take a look at modern async await application, uh, there is a stack. And at the uh, bottom of the stack is operating system, of course. Then we have Python interpreter. And then we have async framework, be it Tornado, Twisted, Curio, Trio, or maybe async IO. And then we have uh, application framework. Maybe it's HTTP or Scenic or something else, or Django or Flask, if they have ever asynchronous versions. And only then you have your applications. So what kind of frameworks do we have? The good news is that Twisted and Tornado uh, can use async await syntax today. And Twisted is actually a mother of async in Python. Uh, so much originated from Twisted, and uh, I think no one even knows how old Twisted is now. But it can use async await now. And both Twisted and Tornado have uh, big ecosystems, and maybe what's even more important, they have a big mind share. So there are lots and lots of questions on Stack Overflow and sometimes answers. <laughs> Tornado today and Twisted very soon, maybe tomorrow, will be able to run on top of AsyncIO. And what it means is that you can call async IO libraries from your Tornado code, or uh, maybe soon from your Twisted code, or maybe you'll be able to use uh, Twisted libraries, which, you have, which we have a lot in your async IO code. So this is, this is quite good. We also have Curie and Trio. Those are two new kids on the block. Both try to explore new approaches. Uh, both try to make async easier and maybe sometimes safer to use. And of course, if they find something new or new useful patterns or good ideas, we'll steal them and put them in async IO. That, that I can promise. Both are not mainstream yet. Uh, Curio is like a year and a half years old. Uh, Trio is, uh, is a few months. Uh, it's really good projects, and I really encourage you to take a look at them and to explore how they are implemented in the inside. It's, it's, it's quite an interesting take of how you should do async or can do async, but not mainstream yet. Anyways, let's talk about async IO. So what is async IO? Async IO is, first of all, a foundation. It defines low-level APIs, high-level async await APIs. It is here to stay and it has a pluggable event loop. So what are those low-level APIs? That's, of course, stuff to schedule callbacks, to write protocols with transports, to do network, sub-processes, handle Unix signals, all callback-based, all very low-level. But this is actually a good thing to have, because it allows us to integrate with other low-level code written in languages like C, C++, and others. On top of that, it has async await to run coroutines and also to do streams and sockets, do network programming, call subprocesses, use locks if you like dead locks, timeouts, cancellations, everything that is handled in async IO. It has all the tools. It is mainstream. Starting with Python 3.6, it's no longer provisional. It's in the standard library. And this is a promise from core development community and from Python community that async IO is a safe foundation to bet on. Uh, it has a healthy ecosystem. Surprisingly, we have, uh, we have a few frameworks right now to do HTTP in Python. It's say, HTTP, Scenic, and there are many others. Uh, we have database uh, libraries like AsyncPG. We have uh, support from MySQL, AIO MySQL. Redis, Memcached, pretty much all of them are covered. We have a swath of libraries and AO Libs organization on GitHub. So I'd say pretty much every major component uh, of um, our systems have, has some sort of async await library um, around it. And it has a pluggable event loop. And this is something that was envisioned in the very beginning of async IO. This is something that lets async IO be integrated with frameworks like Twisted or Tornado. Uh, but it also gives us the ability to switch the event loop and do something, something fun with it, like make it faster. So there is this project called UV Loop, and uh, they, uh, it, it, it has this promise uh, or idea to make async to four times faster. And it does, 
in microbenchmarks. But it's not, it's not surprising to see 15, 20, 30, and sometimes even 50% speed ups in real uh, production code. So if you haven't seen the loop before or haven't tried it, definitely give it a try. Uh, I'd say that at this point of time, it's stable and it's safe to use in production. So try to do it. And here is something else. Uh, we call this Pythonium trioxide. This is a new GitHub group that we created uh, just about a month ago. And it explores a way to bring Rust to Python. So let's get back to this pluggable event loop idea. What if we could have an event loop, an async I/O event loop, written in Rust, so that async I/O becomes a bridge from Python world to Rust world? What if you could call a coroutine implemented in Rust and Python with a timeout and cancel it later? What if you could have an HTTP server or some uh, protocol implemented in Rust and then used in your high-level code? So this is the project that tries to explore that. It's not there yet. Uh, I think it implements most of the uh, async IO APIs right now, but it's still incomplete and still experimental. It's not as fast as UVLOOP right now, but it will be there. Uh, and one of the things that we actually want to focus here is safety. Because UV loop and a lot of other uh, accelerators are written in Scythe and, and, and C, uh, and it's, sometimes you find sec faults, some, sometimes you find bugs. With Rust, you just don't have this, this kind of problem, and you have performance. And Rust is this new shiny thing. It's everybody's favorite language, even though nobody knows it. So it's... <laughs> It's really cool, uh, and I really have high hopes for, uh, for this new thing. So definitely check it out. It's on, it's on GitHub Live. So let's talk about what's next for AsyncIO. What will happen with AsyncIO? We have some goals. We have some goals for Python 3.7. Specifically, one of the first things that we want to make sure of is that we can run and use twisted code on AsyncIO. There were some blockers to that, but I think we kind of addressed them all uh, in 3.6. But in any case, for 3.7, this is one of the things that we want to do. We want, we want to make sure that everything that was developed for Twitter, and there, there is a lot of good code that we can use it in AsyncIO. Another question is, maybe Curio and Trio can be built or rebuilt on top of AsyncIO. Uh, maybe this uh, will let us fix bugs in AsyncIO because of the increased user base or maybe we will be able to have a compatibility between async IO code and Curio code or Trio code. Uh, this is something to explore. Uh, so this is another goal, is to see if we have enough APIs or if our APIs are flexible enough um, to implement new sorts of frameworks, new async await frameworks on top of async IO. And the trust loop. So we have some problems right now in Tokyo uh, for instance, uh, right now it's really hard to have a task or a coroutine in Rust to be fully compatible with Python code. There are some low-level details. It can be worked around it, but we definitely want to make sure that in 3.7 it's straightforward. So maybe if you are writing your next event loop, I don't know, in pure assembly, you will be able to integrate easily with async IO after 3.7. The other thing that we want to focus in uh, Python 3.7 is to improve usability, and specifically to address the issue of documentation. Currently, documentation of async IO is it's huge. Uh, I'd say uh, it's, it's really hard to follow. It's, it's, it focuses too much on low-level details instead of teach people how to use async IO, how to use it in an optimal way, how to maintain code bases with async IO, how to write frameworks and protocols for async IO in an optimal way. And the original documentation, by the way, it was written by Victor Stinner, and I think he deserves some credit for it because he did it single-handedly. When async IO wasn't such a big thing as, as, as it is right now, he, he written all of it, and I think we kind of dropped the ball and we didn't update it, we, we didn't really maintain it. So this is one of the top priorities for 3.7, is to fix the documentation, make async IO easy to learn, add some tutorials to it. So we'll be focusing on that. And of course, if you guys want to help, uh, you're welcome to do so. Usability now. This is an interesting topic. These are the functions that you 
that if you know this function, uh, these functions, you can pretty much write any async IO program. This is, this is all to async IO. There are a couple of more, but not, not really important. If you understand how these functions work, you can do it. But if you, uh, it doesn't work. Anyways, if you, if you look at them, you will see that some functions are prefixed with async IO and some functions are prefixed with loop. And this is another subtle problem of, of async IO and maybe it's also a documentation issue. The idea was that async IO programs try to always pass event loop explicitly in your program. So you always carry the event loop object around you. Uh, you cannot do things without it. So uh, async IO itself, all of async IO unit tests, many of async IO packages, uh, they all accept loop argument, they all expect you to pass it. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of really suboptimal. But in Python 3.6, we fixed get event loop method. And now it behaves deterministically. Whenever you call it from an async await code, it will always return you the correct event loop. So, idea, so the idea is that you can have your high level, beautiful async await API, and whenever you have to go low level in your implementation, you always can get this event loop, but you don't need the user to pass this event loop for you around. So pretty much starting right now, uh, we start to encourage people to design their APIs without explicit event loop in mind. But for 3.7, we'll need to fix many of our APIs and add new APIs to promote this pattern so that high-level async IO programs don't even care about the event loop. It's a low-level detail. Don't think about it. Don't bother with it. We also need to do, we also want to add new things. Uh, one of them is, uh, is start TLS. There are some protocols that start as a clear text and then they suddenly need to upgrade and become secure and they need start TLS. There is also a very uh, frequently requested feature by Armin Ronecker to add call and task context APIs. Perhaps he wants to re-implement Flask or something, but this is quite a serious thing, actually. This is quite a serious uh, issue for large applications. Uh, if you have thousands of lines of code or hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of code, sometimes somewhere deep down below you realize, oh, I need more context. Maybe I need the current request object or maybe I need the current host or port that I am connected to for logging or for something like that. And without rewriting all of your code, you pretty much can't do it. Uh, you cannot use thread local objects because they don't work with async, uh, async and await. You cannot use a global variable because it's a shared state. So it's, it's really hard. And one of the last major thing is, things is to add async IO REPL so that you can just type Python M async IO or maybe just Python and experiment and play with async IO with its native syntax so that you can just write await something and it would do it for you. And overall, we need your help. Uh, ask, for new, ask for the new features. Uh, you can use bugs python.org for bug requests, bug reports, but you can also use it for feature requests. We also have Python Tulip mailing list. Uh, Tulip is the original name of, of async.io, uh, but it's still quite active. Guido reads it and helps people a lot. Uh, a lot of other async.io developers read it. And we also, on GitHub, uh, see Python move to GitHub completely and then uh, Everything now happens on GitHub. You can issue pull requests. It's so much easier. The whole idea of this migration was to involve more people in CPython and also in async IO development. So help us, guys. Uh, I, think, I think async IO has a very bright future, especially with things like uh, Rust integration. Um, this, this, this might enable us to do so much more in the near future. That's it. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, if anyone has any questions, please come up to one of the microphones in the aisles. Um, 
Do you mind comparing the ASYNC.io infrastructure to what's available in other languages? Like, you know, obviously uh, JavaScript has uh, promises and ASYNC await and C Sharp, and just like at a high level, just to get a feel of how, like, are they roughly doing the same thing, or is there an inherent difference between what different languages are doing, since all of them seem to be moving towards having async await at least, but behind it is probably not quite the same. Yes, they're not quite the same, but yes, the idea is, is almost the same. Uh, I'd say one, one of the problems in Python that we have with async.io and async.await is that the language itself originally was designed to be a synchronous thing, so a lot of APIs can actually block. So one of the ideas that we need to research in Python specifically is to find a way to see if your application is making some blocking system calls while, uh, while, while it's doing its async.await thing. Other than that, I'd say Python async await implementation is quite similar to what, what, what you have in JavaScript. If you know how to use it in JavaScript, you know how to use it in Python. Uh, if I'd say, for instance, this context sharing, context uh, object idea, it, it kind of comes from C Sharp where, where they solve this problem for async IO code. So it's, we are at the point where we can, uh, where, where we can copy good ideas from other languages and added to Python. And in many ways, Python support of async await is greater than in any other language. Uh, I, I, I don't think that a lot of languages, or any languages besides Python, have um, asynchronous context managers or asynchronous generators. Uh, Python uh, copied, at least at first, async and await expression from C Sharp, but we added so much more to make it useful. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, I guess, kind of two questions. One, why isn't UV loop the standard uh, loop if it's so much faster than the async IO one? And then also, are there any efforts to improve the, uh, like the steps to start the loop and register your function and everything seem kind of cumbersome from a user standpoint? Are there, are there any efforts to improve the usability there as well? The first question is why UV loop is faster? Or why isn't it the, stand, the async IO default event loop? Uh, UV loop uses libuv. Libuv is the low level uh, library uh, originally developed for Node.js. It's a large dependency, it's, it's a big library, it's a lot of code, and we wouldn't probably, we, we don't need CPython to depend on this library, especially uh, given how easy it is to install UV loop. And async IO, again, it was. It was envisioned from the beginning that such a thing should be possible. So I guess there is not enough motivation to add a lot, a lot uh, of low-level C code to Python uh, at this point of time. The core functionality of uh, async I right now is in pure Python. It's relatively easy to read and, and, and fix. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just not that big of an issue. Uh, as for the second question, Yes, specifically we want to, ra to add two high-level functions, async.io run and async.io run forever. The first one would accept a coroutine and it would just run it. This is like an entry point for a simple async.io application. If you have a complex async.io application which spawns a lot of services, sub-processes, and you kind of have to finalize and clear the state of async.io program consistently, you'll have the second method, which actually accepts a asynchronous generator or an asynchronous context manager. So the idea is that you enter your asynchronous state consistently in, in a synchronous way, and you can clean up your state in a synchronous way consistently. And the whole machinery of creating loop, uh, cleaning up resources, printing out debug information can be handled by this function. But yes, we, we, we definitely we, we recognize this problem that right now it's really it's a cumbersome process to bootstrap async IO application. So yes, uh, we, we have some solutions. We, I'll be working on a PEP, on a new PEP for Python 3.7 uh, pretty soon. And my plan is to have the PEP and have a library on GitHub. Uh, we'll call it AIO Next or AIO Extras or something like that. Uh, prototyping those things so that you guys can start using them and give, uh, give us some feedback uh, before this lands to Python 3.7. I'm uh, curious about the Pi03. Um, is it more about putting some Python in your Rust or putting some Rust in your Python or just simplifying them both? Like what's sort of the use case of the actual Pi03, Pi03 library? 
Yes, the use case is uh, to first enable this integration because we have uh, C Python Rust binding, which allows you to easily create bindings of Rust code to the Python code, but there is no way right now to, to have a, an API, but an asynchronous version of that API, I'd say. Rust code doesn't know anything about asyncio, and asyncio knows nothing about Rust. So asyncio can be a bridge here. The other thing is performance, because yes, you can write a low-level, let's say, HTTP parsing library, or low-level Postgres driver in Rust. It will be very efficient, and it will be probably safer than, than uh, a similar thing written in C. So the idea is that to make it easier to reuse existing Rust code in Python in a synchronous way. Thank you. We have time for one or two more questions, if anyone has any. Thank you very much, Yuri. Thank you.